Good evening, people of God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ on this lovely evening where he gathers the people of God in this place to sing praise to God's name, to witness to our faith, to fellowship with one another in the midst of the Holy Spirit. We're glad you're here to be a part of that. Um, I know there's faces we're seeing here at this service tonight who are here because we have what happening later tonight? The cantata. How many of you are here early? Let's be honest, came to this service so you could be here for your cantata tickets. Now remember, you have to have tickets for that event. You can't just hang out at church first. But I want to remind you, those who just raised their hands, that what you're telling the pastor is that you're perfectly happy to sit in church for three hours at a stretch. <laughs> Pastors take note of things like that. I'm just saying, just saying. You'd notice that too. Do you know who they were? Well, remember that for long services. But no, we're glad you're here to be part of that event or just to worship tonight. It's a wonderful time for us to hear from God's Word. Um, tonight, it's the prophet Habakkuk. We'll hear from him. We'll hear what God has to say to us. We'll sing praise. And of course, we will gather around the table of grace. Um, again, if you're a newcomer here, or whether you're here for the cantata or not, this is not Hope's table, not even a Lutheran table. This is the Lord's table of grace, and it's a family table. All of God's children are welcome. We hope you'll participate when that time comes. Um, this is not the way things always look up here. <clears throat> they look a little different tonight because of the cantata, so we're having to work in a little jammed space, so we hope that you'll uh, work with us in any inconvenience that causes you, but I trust it'll be for a wonderful event as music and the Word are shared in those times. Now, for those of you who are staying, who have your tickets, that's important again, have the tickets and are staying for 8 o'clock cantata, there's a special announcement for you for this service only, and it's in red, so I've got to read it loudly. If you are attending the 8 o'clock p.m. cantata and plan to stay in your seat following the service, you must remain absolutely silent for 15 minutes while we conduct the sound check and prepare for the show. If you leave the room for any reason, you may leave your coat or bag in your seat to reserve it, but you'll have to wait in line outside to get back into the sanctuary. It's very important that we close it down. They would prefer to have everybody leave, and that's always inconvenient for people so they can really set things up and get the sound checks and everything ready without people um, causing some kerfuffles. So if that's the case, uh, what I am going to ask you to do if you're staying is to, we're going to move all of you down to front row kinds of seats, but move you down in one section so you're kind of together. So people don't have to climb over you to get the seats. It's easier if we just block seat you together if you're staying in here. Um, I know that's a little inconvenient for you, but it's better than waiting in line, so just keep that in mind. There are other things to wait in line for as well, such as our budget information meeting tomorrow afternoon. Now, you're all just pining for that time, but it is tomorrow at 12.45 here at Hope Central. It'll be up in the education room um, next door. Please plan on attending that, even though you're at church tonight. It's important to have dialogue about the spending plan, to know where we are, where we feel God's calling us, and to have deep dialogue before the day of the meeting, if we can, for the vote. So this week, is, uh, Sunday afternoon, is the um, discussion. The following week, Sunday, is the vote. Keep that in mind. Our seasonal decorating team, which does such an amazing job every year, is accepting donations in honor or in memory of loved ones uh, for the poinsettias and other holiday de decorations for Christmas. Poinsettias are $12. Please sign up in the Narthex. You'll be able to pick up your poinsettias after the last Christmas Eve service, the evening one, or... After, Sunday, after the Christmas morning service the next day. You can do that as well. And I will add this. Please don't dig up the ones that are out front that they planted so beautifully. Those are not to be taken right now. Just the ones up here, when that time comes, that would be helpful. A reminder, if you did the angel tree gifts, they must be returned to the church next weekend, April, uh, December the 8th and the 9th. Please send, see your instruction card for more information. It's important we have them in then. That's when the trucks are coming to collect them, to take them to the places where the kids get them. So please keep that in mind. If, you are use, if you're coming to the cantata tomorrow and not tonight, you cannot, let me stress that again, cannot use the parking lot at Fairway Christian Church. They are wonderful, lovely neighbors and have often let us use their space for our events. It just happens that this year their event and our event coincide on Sunday. So they need all their parking. So we can park in our parking spaces or down at the Santa Fe shops with the shuttle bus we have going, which is a great way to park. Um, but do that instead, but we cannot use their parking uh, they, they need all the parking they have, so please keep that in mind. We want to be good neighbors to those who have been good neighbors to us. The annual Blue Christmas Worship Service for those who are struggling with um, grief or loss this year um, will be held at 4 p.m. on Sunday, December 23rd. Um, it says at Hope Central Campus. Is that correct? It is? I can't, I can't. Somebody said, I think you said yes. I'm just looking for a head nod. Okay, yes, it is at Hope Central Campus. So remember that that's, it'll be kind of a, and it's an important time to be here in the afternoon, but please come be a part of that if you have need or if you know people that have a need. 
If you know someone who's suffering or going through a difficult time, please let them know about that service. It is a wonderful way of receiving support. And then lastly, I need to let you know about two of those families who are having a hard time. Janet Blasek passed away on this uh, recently. We had announced that before, but now is the time to have the service. This Tuesday, December 4th at 1030 here in this room, we'll have a service of celebration of life and memorial. And then the following Tuesday, also at 1030, so a week from this coming Tuesday, will be a service for um, Bud Mangles, who passed away just a few days ago. We ask you to uphold both of those families in your prayers, surround them with your love, and especially in this time of year, when it happens this close to the holidays, it's easy to combine those things, and all we see that overlap. So please keep them in your hearts and your prayers and your minds, and walk with them as you are able. Those are all the announcements I have. If you'd stand where you are, greet those around you in the love and peace of Christ. Let us join in our call to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the Lord of Israel who comes to set us free, the mighty Savior who comes to show mercy, the dawn from on high who guides us into peace. Amen. Amen. Let us come before God in confession. To you, O God, we lift up our souls. You know us through and through. We confess our sins to you. Remember not our sin. Remember us with your steadfast love. Show us your ways, teach us your paths, and lead us in justice and truth. For the sake of your goodness in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, come with joy and draw water from the well of salvation. Remember the gift of baptism. Your sin is washed away in the name of Jesus. You belong to Christ. You are anointed to serve. Stand up and raise your heads. The reign of God is is near. Amen. Amen. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight for all the earth. Once you sang creation's story, now proclaim us high as
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the refining fire of the Holy Spirit, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, be with you all. Amen. O faithful and loving God, we praise you for your tender compassion and give you thanks for your steadfast love for us and all creation. Bless us who see the light of this wreath that we may be strengthened by the hope of your advent among us and live toward the completion of all things in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Tonight, we light the first candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Merciful protection, alert us to the threatening dangers of our sins, and redeem us for your life of justice. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me, and there is strife and conflict abound. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I, I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it lingers, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer he enables me to tread on the heights. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. 
Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, O Lord. Lord. Then Jesus went with His disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and He said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with Him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then He said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with Me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated and let us pray. <clears throat> now speak, Lord, in this moment while we wait on thee. And hush our hearts to listen with expectancy. Amen. There was pain and suffering and heartache and sin and brokenness and shame in the news this week. How many of you watched that on the news? Now, I want you very loudly to tell me which story I'm talking about on the count of three. One, two, three. All of them. That's a good answer. All of them. <laughs> Touche. Here's the reality. We could all pick our own stories, couldn't we? There's some stories we would all agree on and say, oh yeah, that was terrible. And there's some that might sound worse to some of us than to others, right? I mean, Florida State didn't get a bowl game. How many of you care about that? <laughs> One person. Thanks, Fred. I appreciate it. Go Ohio State. I'll pull for Ohio State just for you now. So it's, you have a situation where if I'd said Ohio State, more people would raise their hands on that, right? There's some stories that just they strike us differently. But the reality is we don't have to look very far to find it. We can all find things like that in the news each and every week, and certainly we've seen it of late. There's the really brash ones that are like the fires in California that are in our face, or perhaps some of you are aware of the unrest in Haiti. There's not a, a, a storm that has come through of a, of a nature with a name like you know, a hurricane. Instead, there's been political unrest and upheaval that's caused a lot of violence in the streets. Um, even our, uh, our brothers and sisters in the Lutheran Church of Haiti are kind of shut down in their homes right now. They can't go out on the streets because it's too violent um, to walk the streets at this point. Uh, we, we, some of us know about this, some don't. But I learned that something, a very special event, took place the middle of this last month. You might be thinking about it. It happened on the 11th day of the 11th month, the 11th day of November last month. What, what am I talking about, do you think? What? Veterans Day. We celebrate it. That's in the news, right? It's on our minds. That's what we think about because that's kind of the headline grabber, right? That's not what I'm talking about. There was a seismic event, like an earthquake event that took place that was so massive and so unusual that has shaken, pun intended, the entire community of geologists that study these things. Here's what happened. Usually when there's a big earthquake, there are some little waves like jagged lines first, seismic activity that lets you know it's coming, and there's these big sine waves that are when everything's shifting and rattling and the world is literally coming apart at the seams. Uh, that's what you see, and, and that's a big event. Everyone knows it's happened. Everyone can feel it. It started in the Indian Ocean, in that area around some little chains of islands where we've had other things. But here's what's unique about it. There was no buildup. It jumped immediately to the massive waves, the kinds of things that listening posts around the globe all picked up. They all knew something massive had happened. And they all started watching for the news to see where it happened and who was impacted, but no one said anything because no one felt it. Everything tells us it was a massive shift seismologically, it was a massive shift that happened somewhere deep in the crust of the earth, but no one took note of it. Yet it affected the whole world. Isn't that weird? You know, we get caught up in things like Veterans Day, and we should on days like that, but this kind of news just kind of slides by so we don't notice. 
it's kind of when I look at Habakkuk, what I think of the story and how I think of a lot of our lives in Scripture, there are those major moments that we say, wait a second, something's wrong. But there's a pervasive underlying element of brokenness in the world that is so deep and so profound, and yet we don't seem to notice it. That's kind of sin and brokenness happening in the world throughout history. Habakkuk, on the other hand, had some very real and very evident um, issues at hand that he could point to to the Lord. And I love this book. Uh, he's, he's kind of a, another guy there at the time the Babylonians coming, one of the many prophets of that time. But his book is different. Well, his story is different than others. It's all about a dialogue with God. And he's very clear on what's happening in this dialogue. And he gives both sides of the dialogue. And he's not a guy who's saying, isn't God just wonderful and grand? He has problems. And he has questions for God. It's like watching the news for us this last week or reading it and hearing bad news, and he says to the Lord, so what are you going to do about this? Where are you in this? Do you even care that these things are happening? Are you aware of how evil your people are being that you've called to be holy? Do you see how broken they are? I mean, there's a remnant over here who are righteous and faithful, but they're hemmed in all around by those who are wicked, and they're being oppressed. Do you at least care about them, Lord? I mean, God, why are you letting bad things happen to good people? How many of you have ever thought that before? Why are you letting this stuff go on? Do something already. That sounds like he would have written this book today, much less over 2,000 years ago. But he was experiencing these problems, and he was so upset, he was so cross with God because he expected God to do something. He believed in a God who cared enough and who said he loved enough and that he was righteous and holy enough that he would not let this stuff happen. He believed God should do something. Now, the flip side of the coin are those who don't believe in God. C.S. Lewis, although he's the great Christian author, maybe the greatest Christian author of the last century um, that's affected the most people, he also, for a large, long period of time in his young life, was actually a very vocal atheist. Um, after his mother died young, he just had problems with that and had walked away from any kind of faith and was a devout atheist. And yet he wrote about it, and he said this, I found myself in that untenable situation of an intellectual atheist. I could not allow myself to believe in God. No doing. But I was furious with God for not existing. That is, I wanted a God I could blame for all the problems, or I wanted a God that would fix the problems. I wanted there to be a God like that, but I couldn't let myself think of it. Now, after many years of being impacted by other people, as he said, um, in a young thinking atheist, you can never be too careful what people you read because it'll change your life. He read George MacDonald and others. It radically changed him to be the man of faith he was later. But, But until that time, he was struggling, much like Habakkuk, from the other side, as it were, both having these great questions of, Why are things in the world the way they are? Is there no one who can change it? Habakkuk would say, absolutely. There's a God who cares and says that things will be changed. And yet things aren't. And yet he continues to pray. He doesn't stop having faith in that. He doesn't stop trusting and and wanting to trust at least. He doesn't stop questioning God because he believes in a God who should do something. He just wants to get God to do it. He's tired of waiting. We have the joy right now of hosting in our home for the weekend um, Danny's class pet um, from their third grade class, which is a dwarf hamster by the name Luna. And she's adorable with her beady little black eyes that she stares at me with. Um, Luna is a great name for her. It means moon because she is a night owl. That's what I mean. They're all nocturnal creatures, which means they run around and do all their noise making in the middle of the night. And the thing she loves to run on most as a hamster is her what? Wheels. You've been there. And this isn't just any wheel. This is kind of a, 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 a plastic contraption that has no bearings that I can tell and no grease on or anything else. It not only spins noisily, but it rattles on itself as it spins. It, it makes quite a racket. And the teacher told us, now at night, if you're going to keep it in his room, make sure you take the wheel out of the cage or she'll make lots of noise. And I said, hey, I want to show justice and mercy to this little animal. It's the only thing she gets to do all night long. It would be like sitting me in a room and saying, sit there with no book or anything, just be quiet all night. It would drive me crazy. So I said, I'll just put her little cage in another room with doors closed. (laughs) It worked a little bit, but it still kept me awake. It was horribly noisy. So I finally went, and I disconnected the wheel, but I left it in her cage. You know what she did? She tried to run on it anyway. 
She just, you heard a little scraping of her feet, trying to make the wheel spin, and she'd get it partway up and then slide back down. I was waiting for her to flip, to be honest with you, watching her, but she just went through the motions because she's a creature of what? Habit. Habakkuk is a, a creature of habit. He prays and he does these things because they're expected. It's in his nature. It's what you do with God. You, you talk to God and you argue with God and you lay your heart before God. And he, like all of us, believes that we're giving God some pretty good suggestions, right? I mean, prayer becomes the suggestion box to the Lord, doesn't it? Lord, if you really want to make the world better, if you want everyone to be happy and to do well, if you would just do blank, it would be better. What do we really say? It would be better for who when we pray? It would be better for us. You guys are great. Really, me, if I'm honest. I may want to be good for other people too, but I really want to be good for me. Lord, if you could just work in the world in this way, that would be fantastic. Amen. End of prayer. Habakkuk, a prophet of the Lord, is caught up in that as well. God, if you just do these things, I have great suggestions for you if you would just do them. But God doesn't work in our timing. And the story of Habakkuk, the, the book, is it starts with him crying out, Hosanna, save now. God, come and fix things. And that's not what God wants from us. I mean, He wants to hear from us, but that's not what God created us for. It's not what we're called to. It, God's not there to just be the 911 dispatcher of heaven for us to do the things we want done. God is to be praised and glorified and worshipped and loved and adored. But when we get problems in our lives that are so close, it's hard to see around those or remember those things. There was a mother who just loved her son. Her beloved son is a famous character in history. Her name is Monica. And Monica prayed every day before the Lord. I mean, she cried, great tears, crying for her son, praying that God would fix her wayward child, that she would bring him, hey, bring him back to the straight and narrow and help him to live his life right, that he'd give his life to Jesus and be a good boy. How many moms have prayed that prayer? And dads, right, in the world. And she prayed and she prayed and she prayed. And her son was a, how can I say this? He was a rascal. Let's just call him a rascal. That's saying it nicely. And she prayed and prayed and prayed. And they lived in, in northern Africa. And then one day he said, I want to move to the big city. Now, imagine a boy growing up in St. Something, Wisconsin, okay, St. Fill-in-the-blank, who says, I want to move to New York and live in the big city. Can you imagine how worried the mom would be? And he says, I want to leave. I'm already doing poorly. I want to leave and go to the big city where all the important people are, where all the fun stuff is. And she's thinking, literally, oh my God, you've got to do something about this. Please intercede. Please keep him from going. Please help him to stay home and be a good boy. And she prays with all of her might, but guess what happens? He goes anyway. And she's gutted by this. But when he gets there, he meets a man by the name of Ambrose, who happens to be the bishop there. And Ambrose has an amazing impact on his life, and he grows, and he comes to know about God's love for him through Christ, and he grows to, be, to fall in love absolutely with the gospel, and his life is transformed, and he begins to preach and teach these things, and he leaves his stamp on the entire western side of church history, really on both sides, but especially the western side. And we've given him a name, and he wrote an autobiography about all these things called the Confessions, and we call him St. Augustine. But she just wanted him to be a good boy. God didn't give her what she wanted in the moment she wanted it. He gave her what her heart's desire truly was. And beyond that, that's even smaller, he gave what was really needed for that young man and for the world when the timing was right. But we have a hard time waiting for those things because it calls us to trust in things we can't know for sure. We want everything to be spelled out and say, this looks like a sure bet. But life isn't like that. And God doesn't tell us if we have faith, it will be. He calls us to be faithful, and Habakkuk has to learn this, not because of what it does for us to be faithful that we get what we want. He calls us to be faithful because we're supposed to be faithful. It's what we're called to. And we have to do it in times that are really difficult when we want to do anything else but that. There's a young airman back in the First World War who learned this lesson. He was flying his uh, fighter plane, just learning the ropes, as it were, and he was flying up at a higher altitude. He was trying to get a feel for how it would fly to do loops and things. And if you don't know about those planes, they were kind of just a wooden frame with canvas stretched over them, uh, and they used rope pulleys to, to move things, sometimes wire, but back in the early days, it was rope often to, to help um, move all the, the aerials and things to help you steer the plane. 
And he was up at an altitude looking down, and he was loving life, and he was getting the feeling for it. And then he felt some kind of resistance as he tried to steer to go up and down a little bit. Something was wrong. And the resistance was kind of strange, and it felt just weird. So he did what you could do back then. He looked back down the tail to see where the ropes were going to see if they were snagged on something. And there he saw a large rat that was gnawing on the rope. And he got really freaked out, as you might imagine. Because if that rope went, he would not be able to control the plane well. He'd not be able to control how he went up and down. It might just go down on its own without any control at all. And he had to decide what to do. And he thought to himself, well, if I start to descend now, if I get down quickly, then before the rope is chewed through, maybe I can land. And he thought about how high up he was, and he thought, you know, the rope will probably be gone before I get down there. I could try, but if I'm already aiming down and the rope goes, I will certainly crash and die. He was terrified of that. And then he remembered something he'd heard about experiments, about wondering how high a plane could fly. And he said, you know, I, I know that the engine can only run up to a certain altitude before the air is too thin. They, there's not enough oxygen. They call it a rare atmosphere because oxygen is rare. He said, and, and I know that, that humans can get to about the same altitude, but when they were doing testing, a lot of other animals can't, that a lot of smaller animals can't survive at that altitude. So what if instead of going down when I feel like I should go down, what if I climb higher? What if I climb into a rare atmosphere, and up there I'm able to survive somehow, even though it's not comfortable, but the problem will be handled because of where I am. I have to trust that maybe that will work. No guarantees. And he took the risk and he climbed higher, and indeed it worked. Faith is the call for us to live in a rare atmosphere, to trust God not when things are easy or, or things are laid out nicely or where we know what the end result will be, but to trust even and perhaps especially when things are grim. Some of our favorite hymns that we have today are because people live through those dark, brooding times. Martin Rinkart wrote, uh, Now Thank We All Our God. Horatio Spafford wrote, It Is Well With My Soul both in times where he had lost family members and were going through dis or deep despair and in a moment of deep agony when they wanted to put their hearts on, in, on paper and they put the pen to the paper, out came hymns of praise. Habakkuk eventually learns to change his Hosanna's God save now to holy hallelujahs, praise God. Not because God is doing what I want, but because God is due the glory and the honor and the praise. And when he learned that his faith was not about him, but about the Lord to be focused on, everything changed for him. The worlds didn't go well. God still sends the Babylonians, and he still wonders, that's how you're fixing, fixing things, by sending worse people to take care of the bad people? Things still don't go well then, but he trusts that eventually God will work things out. How can we trust that today? What hope do we have? We found the beginning of it in the opening of our, uh, our gospel today, which is a short passage of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he is there, and it's not a fear that Jesus has of what might happen that he has to trust God into, he's trusting the Father in what he knows will happen if he trusts the Father. He is certain of the pain and suffering and death that is to come his way. And the human part of him that's fully human says, I do not want that. But his faithfulness to the Father says, not my will, but your will be done. And he lives into it for the sake of us, because he loves us so much, and calls us then to abide with him and to live lives of faith that trust in God, not as blindly as Habakkuk had, who just trusted a word that was spoken through the prophets, but the word that lived in our midst. What better emblem can we have of trusting God, that God is faithful to us, than his son being born in the stable in Bethlehem. And what did he say to those parents? And you shall call his name Jesus. And then we call him hope. And we call him joy. And we call him peace. And we call him salvation. And we call him redemption. And we call him Lord. And we call him God. Because he is. And we are called in turn to praise Him, to live lives of faithfulness that trust into a dark future that we cannot understand, that won't always be bad, but sometimes is, but we trust in and through it, knowing that God keeps all things in His hands, and in the end, that God's will will be done. And we pray it whenever we're together. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, let it begin with us. Lord, we who so often pray, Hosanna, May we change our tune and sing holy 
hallelujahs, that we praise you with our voices and with our hearts and with our lives, even in the dark times of life, that we might be a light in the midst of the darkness, that we, like the people who wrote hymns in the past, will draw people to a place of seeing that you matter and that you love us, even when things are bad, that we are called to trust in you. For Lord, we do. We thank you for your word that lived in our midst, that we might know you more fully and trust you more completely. And we give you thanks for the spirit that enables us to live lives of faith even this day. We just pray, Lord, we'll do it a little more each day. As the candles are lit around the Advent wreath, that our lights will burn brighter and the world might be made a little brighter as well. For the sake of the one we call our Lord, even Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. He came down that we may have love. He came down that, that we, we may have love. He came down that we may have love. Hallelujah. together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he has sent into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of salvation, you sent your Son to seek out and save. Hear our prayers on behalf of those who are lost in our day, receiving these petitions and thanksgivings with your unending compassion. Holy One, as we begin the Advent season of Advent, fill us with your presence as you wrap your arms around us and fill us with hope, peace, love, and joy. Help us to remember that we cannot find these things if we do not first seek your balance in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, we are not a patient people. We are in the season of waiting, and we are asking for your guidance. Give us peace and hope as we wait for the new places you take us and the people you will bring into our lives. Fill our hearts with joy and love as we share with, the, with others and become your hands and feet in the world around us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy God, our lives are often filled with heartaches, worry, and illness. Send your spirit into our lives that we might live our lives confident that you hear our prayers. Give peace to those grieving. Give hope to those who find themselves facing difficult decisions. And send healing to those who are sick. We pray today for those who have asked us to pray for them in our hearts and on our lips. Pray. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Redeeming sustainer, visit your people and pour out your strength and courage upon us that we may hurry to make you welcome, not only in our concern for others, but by serving them generously and faithfully. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You receive the offering. You may be seated.
up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are those who In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, Jesus' life and ministry, his call for us to follow, his death and resurrection, we lift this bread and cup before you, O God, giving thanks that you have made us your servant people. Please join hands as a community. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom in the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God fills the hungry with good things. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You may be seated. Follow the direction of the ushers.
Lord God, we ask you to bless those of this congregation who will take this to our homebound friends and members. Guide them and direct them so that those who receive this body and blood of Christ may find strength for their days ahead. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's arise. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood strengthen you and keep you unto eternal life. Amen. In your Advent preparation, remain watchful with your eyes for Christ, whose birth in a manger is but a promise of his coming again in glory. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Jesus.